Millions and millions of innocent human beings were lost because of the Roe vs. Wade decision. Pro-life is alive. They don't care if people die. The ongoing debate over abortion flares in Florida. And this executive order protects patient privacy and access to information. The president protects abortion access. Uh, we knew that we were going to have to uh, move forward um, and, and continue the legal battle. Of Florida protects its abortion restrictions. The need, the laws. Where does the fight go next? There is something for everybody on this election. Changes at the ballot box. We all care deeply about election integrity, so we want to make it difficult for people to cheat. Election protection, behind the scenes planning for the primaries. The protests, the predictions. One year later, has anything changed in Cuba? We are asking all those freedom-loving members of our community to display Cuban flags on their cars and homes wherever visible in solidarity with the fight for freedom of the Cuban people. The Big Stories of the Week, live this week in South Florida. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putnam. I'm Glenna Milberg. We begin with the volley of court filings that stops with Florida's new abortion law firmly in place. President Biden announced an executive order Friday protecting abortion access nationally, though in Florida, the new abortion restrictions ping-ponged between enforceable, unconstitutional, on hold, and now back in effect. A judge in Tallahassee had first ruled that Florida's new 15-week law violated the privacy clause in the state constitution, and he issued an injunction. The state, however, appealed, and that law remains in effect during the appeal process. With us now to get some well-rounded clarity is Tawana Aman, who is the director of the Broward Chapter of Florida Right to Life, and Maite Canino is deputy organizing director of Planned Parenthood for Southeast and North Florida. Ladies, it is so good to have you with us on this Sunday morning. We Thank are, you. Yeah. Thank you. Great to be here. Great. We are so glad that you are, especially Tawana. We, you know, uh, we strive to be balanced here, and we're glad that you are here. So let me begin with a we basic appreciate question. That. You're, you're quite welcome. The fundamental question, I believe, for most people, been debated all of my adult life, is whether a woman has the fundal, fundamental right to decide whether to carry an, a, a pregnancy to term or to have an abortion beforehand. And the obviously the uh, pro-choice side says that is her right and for 50 years it was the law of the land. Why was that law wrong and what, what do you, why do you believe that in fact there is a compelling state interest to get involved here? Well, I think that it was never a constitutional, it's not in the constitution about the right to abortion. Even the Florida constitution with the privacy laws they were written, if you look at the intent in the late 70s and early 80s, it was dealing with information privacy. It wasn't dealing with the right to an abortion. And having had an abortion myself, having suffered physically and emotionally from it, I feel that it took me time to understand that a life begins at conception, that like the 15 week ban, this child is in the womb, kicking and moving around with arms and legs and fingers and toes. and at 15 weeks, they literally have to dismember and dismantle that baby and put it back together. It is not a blob. It is not a mass. And I think what's sad is women believe that they have a right and their rights trump the right of the child. And we believe that every l life has a right to life. So, um, Tawana, thank you for that. I, I want to talk about the law here and now in Florida sure. because it has ping ponged in the past couple of days back and forth sure. legally. Um, and you both ha or belong to organizations that counsel pregnant women. And so right. from both of you, and Maite, let's start with you. I I'd love to hear what you are counseling and telling your clients now relative to where Florida is legally with abortion access. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me today. So um, we talk to our patients when they come in about, you know, first we uh, talk to them, give them education about what they're going to um, be doing, making sure that they're there on their own will, and then um, talk to them about, because many there's a lot of confusion. <laughs> a lot of people think because of what happened in the Supreme Court, abortion is not legal in the country right now. And it is, and it all depends on what state you're in. So we let them know, like, what is the rules and regulations we have here, for example, the 24-hour waiting period. So when they come to us, we're not going to have the procedure that day, but we'll do the education and we will um, go over with them um, what the process is going to look like. And then they're going to go home and come back for their second appointment, which unfortunately is not 24 hours after just because of so many appointments that we have. It might take a few days. So it's prolonging the procedure to, to happen um, for them. So that is what we're talking to our, our patients when they come in the door to see us. We give them all information, any questions that they ask. And we make sure also to screen to make sure that they're there on their own will, not victims of violence or domestic um, violence or someone's making them do that. Yeah. Uh, my team, let me ask you, uh, we know that the, the law as it's written now in the state of Florida, um, that you know, approximately 94, 95% of women who have an abortion, and there were roughly 80,000 of them in the last year, uh, in Florida, that you know, 94% of them have an abortion in the first trimester. So, what is the hardship, as it were, uh, not neglecting the 6% who have a later abortion, but what is the hardship about a 15 week limit? What we see, most of the women that come to us, they come in earlier in the pregnancy. Um, the ones that we see that come in later in their in the pregnancy is due to problem in the pregnancy, um, because you can't really see uh, those fetal anomalies until after the 15 week time. Um, we do also will get um, victims of sexual violence, incest. Um, that come later because of the trauma that they have incurred. Uh, it takes them a while to realize that they are are pregnant and there's no exception for that in this law for them. Um, so those are the patients we see. It's to us, even though we hear all the time it's 60% or 3%, every person that walks in our door is an important person. Every reason is important for them. And we wanna make sure they receive the care that they need. I talk to our doctors all the time and their greatest fear is with this new law, the 15 week law, is that someone's gonna come because they're gonna need an abortion and they're going to have to send them away, send them somewhere else when they're seeking this in the hardest time of their life. When they're seeking abortion, they're gonna have to go to North Carolina or somewhere else. You know, at the end of the day, they're medical providers and we're stepping in by making these restrictions that are not medically necessary between that, their patient um, and doctor privilege that they have. Tawana, that's, um, I want to pick up on that with you. you sure. Um, your perspective and your organization is a faith-based organiz faith yes. organization. Yes, absolutely. And, and so the, the legal case that is still in play right now is based on the privacy protections that the state affords. So talk to us a little bit about it, th this case really makes what the judge considered to be a good case that the law violates privacy protections of women. What do, what do you, how do you see that? Well, you know, you have to do the research. I mean, I was doing that over the past couple of days in relation to when the privacy law was written and it was about the intrusion of uh, information, taking the government, getting information from us, the government intruding in our lives in that respect, not in respect to an abortion. I think that, you know, having had an abortion myself and, and like the, the representative from Planned Parenthood, we, there's both sides to the coin. But when you look at the 15 week ban, we're not talking about the heartbeat ban. We're talking about the 15 weeks where this child is literally dismembered. And when you look at the statistics, I, can I just, can I the, just go on record as saying there, there is science that shows otherwise. And I, I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, let me just say that the Florida Department of Health, the Office of Vital Statistics, shows the majority of women are in their 20s who have abortions, over 60, almost 60 percent, that the majority are elective, that the anomalies and the life endangerment are, are low percentage-wise. I mean, we're talking less than 4 or 5 percent. So 
what when you look at the numbers and you see that a lot of women, I mean, I counsel a lot of women that are going into the abortion facilities and it's not the right time. I'm not ready. I've got the career and the college. And and I feel like abortion is now a method of birth control because what's happening is the woman decides, hey, I can go out and, and surely there's difficult things that women get themselves into. But I've counseled a lot of women that it's just not the right time, including myself. That was my reason. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like you know, this is not just a method of birth control. When you're looking, we all began in our mother's womb. You, uh, Glenna and, and Michael and us, we're all here because our moms chose life. And we never know what that child will end up becoming. And yeah. we, I feel like we play like we're God and decide the fate of an individual when we look at circumstances. And we don't know how those circumstances will, will change. And I know I've been in prison ministry for a number of years. And I've seen so much redemption and so much healing and so much rest restoration and so many lives changed that I feel like we're making a judgment call. And, and I think to me being, you know, pro-life and having had an abortion and being pro-abortion myself, it was the most selfish thing I ever did. Because if you want a baby, you celebrate the baby, you celebrate life. And if you don't, then you can, I mean, they throw the babies away. Joanna, we, 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 uh, we respect your point of view and your faith in the belief that life begins at conception. I just want to, as a fact check, put in here that I knew Senator Jack Gordon of Miami Beach, who was the sponsor of the privacy clause that got passed by the voters of the state of Florida. And in 1980, Jack Gordon told me one of the provisions he wanted that to cover was the right for a woman to have an abortion. So I got it from the guy who sponsored it. So let me just put that out there. Before but it wasn't it wasn't in the record. And that wasn't the majority, Michael, when you look at the intent and you look at the other, you know, you, ha you can't just look at one individual. You know, it's just like the 15 week ban. There was talk about going to a all out ban or going to a six week ban. And you know how this works with you. You're a political commentator. You know how it works with getting all the votes and getting everybody on board and how, you know, rigorous yeah. that whole process is. That's why we're at 15 it, and not at six. It's it's a complicated process, no question. It is a complicated we have, process. Tawana and Maite, we have, but and I have many more questions. Stay where you are, we'll be right back. Sure. Sure. We are back speaking about Florida's new abortion law, where it is, where it stands with Maite Canino from Planned Parenthood and Tawana Aman from Broward's Right to Life chapter. Um, Tawana brought up something interesting, Maite, that I'd like to get your perspective on. In the last segment, she was talking about uh, how women that she has come across use abortion, the choice for abortion, almost as an alternative to contraception. Um, and, and I heard actually a lot of that as part of the debate in Tallahassee as this bill was moving forward. Uh, and yet there are so many other women with so many other instances. And one of the things that this bill does not have an exception for is pregnancy via crimes like rape or incest or human trafficking. And Maite, the, the lack of that exception, I'm wondering if you have ever uh, encountered or, or counseled any women who find themselves victimized like that who, who now it seems at this point, we'll have to carry those babies to term. Um, yeah, it's it's a very cruel bill because it, ha it doesn't have these exceptions. We did have people that went to Tallahassee and spoke about um, their um, lived experience and what had happened to them uh, growing up in a household was incest, being victims of rape and how there was no exception to this law. And when they were testifying, after there were members that would say, well, in the end of the day, you you know, you would have just had to carry it and that's it. And taking away what they have experienced and what they the trauma that they had gone through. And and it's 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 very sad for someone to travel with Tallahassee and have to hear that when they probably felt that they were it was their fault, that they were victims for all those years or or that one instant that you the victim always blames themselves. Also the the conversation about using abortion as birth control is one that raises a stigma against, you know, women that have to access it for many different reasons. At Planned Parenthood, we actually do educate people about birth control. And we are, we not only we educate them about birth control, but we advocate for extension of birth control being more accessible to people. One thing that we saw this legis legislative session 
was the removal in the budget of LARC's long acting reversible contraception being removed um, to be able to pay the insertion and extraction and inserting and, and removing these LARCs that is co comes with a heavy cost if you don't have insurance. So we we educate people on birth control. We give we offer them that even after they come to access an abortion. We don't stigmatize them. We don't blame them. We give them the care that they need and also the education that's needed of them. Um, each person has a different lived experience. I would never disregard a person's lived experience um, of what they have gone through to be to reach where they're at. Yeah. Uh, Tuana, let me um, cite a study I read recently and get your comment on it. It said sure. that the, the majority of women who seek an abortion are in their late 20s, early 30s. They have two children already. And for economic or other reasons, maybe they've then separated from their uh, husband, uh, that they just, for a variety of reasons, do not want to have a child. What would you say as a counselor to that woman? Well, I think that, uh, Michael, we all can attest to having difficulties in our lives, growing up with trauma, growing up in abusive homes even, um, in broken relationships. We all have a testimony. And I think that when a woman comes to us, we're wanting to give her hope. We know that women have suffered after abortion. There's Silent No More, which is a website that has thousands of testimonies of men and women. That's not that's only one of the many I can I can quote, but of women and men who have come out and said, you know, I understand now it was a life. They didn't give me the development of the unborn. They didn't tell me what would happen during the abortion procedure to the unborn child. And that's how I came to the realization of what abortion was. I heard it on a broadcast. I didn't believe it. I went online. I did some yeah. studying and research. And that's what set me into a state of depression and a spiraling downward. So we're helping women understand that we have resources. We have uh, the ability if they need a place to stay. If, I mean, we have counseled Michael and, and Glenna. We have counseled hundreds and hundreds of women that have kept their babies. And we have walked them through the pregnancy. This idea that we would just uh, let them keep their babies and all we care about is the child. It's not true. We're, we wanna love them both. We're for women and children, but we believe that every child is a wanted child. Adoption is always an option. I, I know individuals like Rebecca Kessling, a wonderful attorney, a pro-life speaker international, Pam Stencil, an abstinent speaker. They were conceived in rape and they say to, to you, why don't I have a right to be here? Uh, so before we run out of time, just uh, one more question about the law as it stands now. In the in Florida's new law, the consequences go to those, and this is a quote out of the law, the consequences go to those who actively participate in terminating a pregnancy. Maite, are you concerned that Planned Parenthood, either your chapter or others, might be targeted by this law in some way? What we're seeing now, it's a healthcare crisis. There's gonna be a point that pregnant women are gonna come go to emergency rooms because they're having problems in the pregnancies and doctors are not gonna to wanna to care for them because they're afraid, what are they gonna do? What are the repercussions that are gonna be due? How about if this is an atopic pregnancy? What do they do? What is the problem in the pregnancy? We're gonna to get to that point of people not being uh, doctors who are there to help medically people not being able to do what they have been trained to do medically. So yeah, there will be repercussions. Um, there will be people, there will be people policing other people um, and being, and we're going to go back to the days where women were going to unsafe places and doing and dying yeah. because they did not receive the help, because they did not receive the proper care that yes. they needed. Maite, if I can jump in here, we only have a few seconds left. You know, people who want to have a baby and have to go through in vitro fertilization, uh, right. is, is there a possibility that a woman who has stored embryos and they're frozen, uh, Will, you know, will she have to keep those embryos frozen or will her order to destroy the embryos, will that be considered a violation of this law? What we're seeing is there a possibility for everything. Who would have thought there was going to be a law on the books that doesn't even look at a person that has been a victim of rape or incest or trafficking? 
medically, yes. When you do in vitro, there are some unhealthy fertilized eggs that can that will not grow. So that's part of it. So we could see anything at this point. Um, I, I just want to throw out there the suggestion that an embryo would not have been reaching the 15 week mark. So so that might be you know a consideration as well. In any case, a uh, great discussion, and we thank you so much, both yeah, Mike thanks and Camino, for having Joanna us. Aman, for sure, and yeah. we'll have you on again. Thanks. Yeah, you. please. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you both very much. All right. Next, big changes are coming to next month's midterm elections and the way you vote. We go behind the scenes with the planning for all of that when we come right back. We are about a month out from the start of midterm and primary voting. So I talk about it now because <laughs> big changes are coming for the August election. The first with those changes in place. South Florida elections headquarters are right now in the thick of planning, training, testing. I know that I got a new voter registration card this week from the Miami-Dade Elections Department. And uh, Joe Scott is about to send something out here from Broward. Joe Scott, great to have you aboard. I know you're uh, you're in the thick of the changes. Yeah, good morning, Michael and Glenn, and thanks for having me on. So what what is the biggest change, do you think? There's redistricting was huge, um, but there's so many others. But what is, what's your calculus right now? What are you changing up? So I believe that the biggest change that's happening right now just has to do with, a lot of it is administration focused. So if you're one of those people who votes on election day, there will be changes in terms of your polling place that you have to go to, and that's probably the biggest thing. If you if you are somebody who votes early, uh, whether you vote early in person or vote early by mail, the process will look very, very similar to the way it did in the past. And Joe, how are you alerting the, what, uh, one million or so voters in Broward County about uh, whatever changes they have caused by redistricting, or I know that you have uh, cut down the number of precincts that are going to be open. How are you letting them know all the new information, pertinent information? Yeah, that's right. So everybody had to redesign their precinct maps um, after redistricting. You know, this time for us here in Broward County, this was a great opportunity for us to do really a major reconstruction of our precincts. The fact is when redistricting happens, when the lawmakers in Tallahassee and even our local commissioners uh, redraw their maps. A lot of times they don't necessarily uh, pay attention to where the precinct lines were previously. So sometimes you'll end up seeing precincts that get split up between different districts. And it's always great to have a precinct that where everybody has the same ballot that's voting in that precinct. So this was a great opportunity for us to go ahead and do a, a major redesign. And, and we believe that it's going to be a much more orderly and a better experience for voters um, as a result. But it is important for voters to know that that voter information card is coming in the mail. Um, there's many people have already gotten it. I'd say well over half of the voters out there in Broward County have already gotten it. And pretty much everybody else will get it in the coming days. And I believe that that's also the case for Miami-Dade County. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody should be getting the voter information card in the mail. And for us in Broward County, there will be another mailer that's going out a little bit closer to the election just to make sure that everybody's aware of these changes and what's new and, uh, and what they need to be prepared for. And that's going to be a very big deal, a big change, when people all of a sudden get a new voter card in the mail that they didn't necessarily ask for. So I think that's something that we really should key in on, that everyone needs to be aware of that, because we've seen in past elections uh, there are attempts to dupe voters. I'm not sure dupe is too strong of a word. That's a good word. Um, thank you. So, <laughs> So it's really important for people to take ownership and responsibility that all their information is is correct on those cards. Um, and so, and yes, you're right, we Christina White and Miami Dade, Joyce Griffin, supervisor in Monroe, all of South Florida voters are really in, in focus right now. So there's also this new election, uh, a new law, Florida law, election security office, the Office of Election Security, uh, a law meant to secure elections, even though our elections by all accounts have been very secure. So, so Joe, the rhetoric around that law and the debate around the law, I, I think really concerned a lot of people that we've spoken to. Um, I, would, I would like to hear from, you know, the guy at the top, is, is that worrisome to you, these new laws that secure the votes? Should, should people be worried about that? 
Well, As we watch so the we governor learned, sign that bill. <laughs> <laughs> we, we learned this week that the governor has chosen to appoint Peter Antonacci to head that new Office of Election Security. Um, and and, I, and I'm actually, I was very happy to hear that. So um, Director Antonacci is somebody that I had an opportunity to get to know during my own transition because he was, in fact, the supervisor of elections in Broward County mm -hmm. um, during the interim period after Dr. Snipes retired and before I was elected. So he's the person who was, um, who was our um, person that was, you know, the interim supervisor here. So he's the person who invited me in after I won the election. He invited me to come in. He showed me the ropes, taught me everything. And I felt like he had done a good job. He was a good man. He was somebody who was very principled. Um, he's far more conservative than I am. And he approached the job more as a prosecutor, where I approached the job more as a voting rights advocate. So, um, so we have our differences, but I think there were far worse choices that could have been picked. Yeah. Well, I think it goes without saying, Pete Antonacci did a very good job as the Broward County uh, Supervisor of Elections appointed by the governor. And he's also run South Florida Water Management District. He's done a lot of jobs. He's sort of the Mr. Fix-It of Florida politics for Republicans. Uh, on, on the other hand, Joe, the people who he is now in charge of are out there supposedly looking for election fraud and wrongdoing. But your office and the Broward State Attorney, you've always had that power and you've exercised it. That's correct. And we will continue to. So there is this new state agency that's being stood up. Uh, so far, it's an agency of one person, and that person would be Director Antonacci, and he's working to build his team. Um, I, I will be far more concerned when he, you know, he won't be there forever. So when he decides to retire, we have to really look at who is going to be staffing that office, because it's very, very important that we don't end up with somebody who is openly partisan, who is focused on um, who is focused on trying to make it difficult for, uh, you know, for, especially for minority voters to get out. Because that's really the concern when you talk about over-policing, that over-policing tends to happen in minority communities. So we want to make sure that whoever's occupying that office and the people that he hires are aware of the potential pitfalls and that they are very conscious of not, um, of not falling into the, the, you know, into that pattern that we've seen in the past. And aside from that election security office there, it, the law is much more broad than that. It, it really sets parameters for the vote by mail, for the drop boxes, which have been renamed to intake boxes. Um, is Broward and, Broward and Miami-Dade elections and Monroe elections administratively are very similar. Are, are voters going to see a lot of changes in that respect? Uh, you know, I, I, I'll be interested to see what voters think after the election cycle has gone through. I think a lot of the changes have to do more with behind the scenes, the way that we handle it from an administrative standpoint. So, um, you know, so I don't think people should be uncomfortable at all with um, continuing to, you know, whether they want to mail their ballot back to us, whether they want to drop it off. In terms of security, we have protocols in place that we're going to handle at the drop boxes as well as back in our uh, back in our office to make sure that we maintain the integrity of our elections. But voters, I hope that for voters, it's a pretty transparent process where it continues to operate the way they've seen it in the past, and they continue to feel welcome and encouraged to get out and participate. We want everybody to feel comfortable voting, but we also want people who might have um, uh, negative motives, we want them to be afraid to do something wrong. Because if you, if you are, if it is your intention to break the law, we want you to know that that's not going to work. But if you are just a voter who wants to participate in our elections, you should feel 100 percent comfortable and you have nothing to worry about. You have been duly promised and threatened at the same time. <laughs> Joe Scott, <laughs> great to have you aboard. Thanks so much for being with us. And we will be so in touch over the next month. Thanks, Joe. And by the way, Thanks for me. mark your calendar for next Sunday evening, July 17th, as we head into midterm elections, our local 10 program with all the information you need to, right there, make it count. And up next, one year since spontaneous grassroots pro uh, protests across Cuba, has that spark change? We are going to talk to some people on the front lines about that, and that is next.
Those voices still ring in our ears. All those Cubans on the streets in Havana and all across the island one year ago, they took to the street demanding libertad and basic human rights, and it was sparked by years of repression and severe supply shortages. What some saw as the possible beginning of change in Cuba did not materialize, was the government cracked down harshly, made arrests, and spurred a growing exodus of Cubans. This weekend, the Biden administration imposed visa restrictions on 28 Cuban officials identified as participating in the crackdown on those protesters. Locally, exile groups are planning events to mark that day tomorrow. Salome Garcia is the leader of a group that's monitored that crackdown. In English, her group is known as the July 11th Justice. Salome, it is great to have you with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for the invitation. We, we are so glad that you are here. We know that you have been monitoring, monitoring, tracking the crackdown, which was just brutal and harsh in Cuba. I mean, and just two weeks ago, just to cite one instance, the composer of Patria y Vida, a famous song, kind of an anthem, he was what, sentenced to nine years in prison? Yes, Michael Osorbo was, was sentenced, and as well as Luis Manuel Otero Alcántara, he was, uh, he's the leader of Movimiento San Isidro, and right now is, he's in his seventh day of a hunger and thirst strike, protesting um, his, his conviction. Um, he's one of the few activists who were detained. He didn't even get to participate in the protest. Uh, what, what our monitoring tells us is that over 90 people who were detained from over 1,500 uh, were not part of any opposition group, were not activists, were not independent press. So most people detained were just common people who had never participated in, in politics. Um, a lot of them were self-employed, but some of them were also artists, students, or even state workers, um, nurses, teachers, you know, really uh, common people. Uh, as well, Jose Daniel Ferrer is also one of the activists who were arrested without even getting to the, to the protest. He's today uh, missing, like uh, he hasn't been allowed to communicate with, with his family. This has been the situation. This is one of the forms of, of torture we have denounced of mistreatment inside prisons. Um, people are isolated or punished in, in solitary cells. So Salome, I, I think, um, you know, for anyone who may not be a, you know, Cuba watcher, it seems like on face value, nothing has changed. And yet a year ago tomorrow, we watched these spontaneous grassroots surprising protests pop up all over, fueled by social media, which is a game changer in a closed society. And so really the, the expectation that this would be the beginning of change doesn't seem to have come to fruition. What's your take on that? Well, I do think uh, things have changed. Uh, repression is uh, worse, definitely. Today, uh, actually on the eve of the, of the anniversary, uh, even before a week before, activists, journalists have been getting citations by the police. Uh, they they have been receiving threats of not going out to the streets tomorrow or today. Let's remember July 11 was a Sunday. Um, also, families of political prisoners who have been very outspoken um, have police watched today outside their homes. Uh, let's remember that even though most sentences, uh, we have recorded uh, over six, 600 people being sentenced to up to 25 years, but some of them were trialed in, in summary trials without defense and they were sentenced to um, up to one year. So some of them have been released already, which is the case of Gabriela Sequeira. She's 17 years old. She denounced that she received sexual threats in, in prison. And she has denounced recently that she has been getting threats not to go out tomorrow. Um, so the repression is higher, but also I think there has been change. I mean, there's been an awakening. A lot of people who still believed in the process in this so-called revolution um, have, have been uh, woken up to the reality of this uh, systematic repression because they have been suffering it 
uh, in their self, in their in their own families. There are a lot of families suffering. There's over 700 people in prison. So all these families that have never been exposed to uh, this kind of repression before have been suffering it uh, in the in the first person. We also know that um, uh, like. It's been told by the by the media that the that the only cause for this massive exodus is the the, the scarcity of food, which is also um, uh, a fault of this of the state, of course. But also, people are, are fleeing because they want to be free. They want to be able to express freely. Do not have police watch. Do not do not have their their phones tapped. Do not have. Do not be fine for expressing themselves in social media. So we also know that a great part of people who have been released, over 40 people who have been released, uh, they have left the country. And also um, well-known activists such as Anameli Ramos, who was recently denied her right to return to Cuba. This is also the case of Amara Ruiz Urquiola. They were both in 2020 uh, in this uh, San Isidro lockdown where they did a, a massive hunger strike. And today also, um, Ariel Ruiz Urquiola, Omara's brother, is in front of the UN in, in Geneva. He's, he's also doing a hunger and thirst strike, demanding that, that the UN condemns the, this, this violation that's been going on for, for decades of not allowing people to go back to Cuba, even if they want to go back with the risk of going to prison to continue to protest. Yeah. Salome Garcia, awfully good to speak with you. Thank you for the work you're doing monitoring these repressive acts uh, against the Cuban people. And uh, we'll follow, see what happens tomorrow. Thank you, Salome. Thank you so much. All right, up next, another perspective on the situation in Cuba. A local professor immersed in studying that from past to future is next. Those protests in Cuba a year ago were the biggest in the history of the 60-year-old Castro Revolution. And many predicted that the government there would be forced to respond with some reforms. But has anything really changed? We want to ask Professor Michael Bustamante. He is Professor of History, University of Miami, and the Emilio Bacardi Moreau Chair in Cuban and Cuban-American Studies. Welcome. Professor Bustamante, welcome, Michael. We're glad you're here. Thanks for having me. All right, so we have seen what the Diaz-Canel government did in the past year. Is there any hope that, in fact, they would be less repressive if people come out on the streets tomorrow in Havana and Santiago de Cuba and all over the island? Not really. Um, you know, I haven't seen many people raising a ton of expectations that we're going to see, uh, you know, anything like what happened a year ago tomorrow, despite the fact that it's, uh, that it's the anniversary. Um, I think it's safe to say that given the last year of a very intense punitive response from the government, any similar activities that might be planned for tomorrow would be met with a, a similar response. You know, that, that's such an interesting concept because one year ago, one year ago sometimes seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? But, but really, it had, what, not that long ago, the, certainly South Florida and the world watched in amazement as all of these people really in a grassroots, unplanned way bubbled up against the government for whatever their reasons, economic, social. Um, and there was some real, including from you, according to past articles, some <laughs> real expectation that this was a watershed moment with change on the way, especially with mm -hmm. social media and internet now involved. What happened? Well, I think it still was a watershed moment, um, whatever the results have been. I mean, nothing like it had happened in 60 years. Um, you know, nothing like it might happen for, for a while. And that doesn't make it not a watershed moment. I think it was historic for, for you know, perhaps the, you know, the obvious reasons, right? But what has happened since is not only a, a punitive response, um, it's, there's been a, a mass migration. I think one of the key contextual factors that contributed, at least in part, to what we saw a year ago was the fact that at that moment, Cuba in terms of the pandemic on the healthcare side of, of that issue was at its worst moment. Since then, there's been a vaccine campaign, a vaccination campaign that has been successful by most estimations. And so that I think combined with the opening of borders, frankly, since November has served to kind of decrease pressure inside uh, and people um, are, are you know, seeking horizons elsewhere. That plus the punitive response from the government um, has, I think, you know, 
put us where we are today. Yeah. Uh, Michael, we see yesterday that Secretary of State Anthony Blinken announced that there are going to be 28 Cuban officials uh, who are going to have visa restrictions imposed on them. But isn't that kind of an empty gesture? I mean, these Cubans did not want to travel to the United States in the first place, but it seems like a symbolic uh, a gesture, but it seems somewhat empty, doesn't it? Yeah, I'd have to agree. And it's not the first um, gesture of that kind that we've seen from the Biden administration since the events a year ago. Uh, the Biden administration has, uh, in a sense, taken a kind of a novel approach in terms of U.S.-Cuba policy in applying targeted sanctions on individuals in the government, right, rather than on blanket institutions or blank blanket sort of ways of the United States uh, engaging. Um, one might say that that could be meaningful were it not for the most comprehensive sanctions, uh, general sanctions policies that we have virtually in any country around the world, right, which makes the, the impact of those targeted sanctions, I think, uh, lesser and, and makes them seem, you know, symbolic uh, and, and, you know, perhaps empty gestures. Yeah. So what is then the pressure from your bird's eye view? What is the way to pressure the Cuban government? Or, and should we be? <laughs> You know, this is this goes toward a longer debate about um, U.S. Cuba policy that's uh, certainly has ups and downs. We've been through a particularly sort of intense yo-yo, I would say, of approaches over the past decade from the uh, normalization or the attempt to normal normalize relations under the Obama administration to the imposition of a quote unquote maximum pressure campaign. Um, under the Trump administration. And, you know, my bird's eye view as a historian is that it's actually not the United States that's going to change the future of Cuba, um, whether that's a, a sanctions policy, whether that's a, a quote unquote engagement policy. My own view is that one of the things that uh, the you know, sort of I think fuels what uh, sort of loyalty there may be to the Cuban government is this idea of this kind of internal contest with the, the hegemonic power 90 miles away. So I've long argued that I think in a big picture scenario, the United States sort of needs to take itself out of the game as the boogeyman in Cuba's internal affairs. And in that I think it would make it uh, more difficult for the Cuban government to essentially blame uh, all of its problems on the United States as it tends to do today. Yeah. Uh, Michael, we obviously know that the Biden administration has a lot on its place when, plate when it comes to foreign policy war in Ukraine, principally among them. Uh, but who is driving U.S. policy towards Cuba right now? Because during the Trump era, uh, Marco Rubio had a huge voice in the direction of the president, what he wanted in Cuba. Who is doing that now, if anybody? Senator Menendez from New Jersey, or who is it? Well, until recently, I would say Senator Menendez. I mean, I think Senator Menendez still has an influential voice with the Biden administration, in part because of that ever delicate balance in the Senate, right? Uh, and so the Biden administration, since coming in, despite campaign promises uh, to lift uh, many of the increased sanctions that the Trump administration had put in place, they were very wary of crossing Senator Menendez, right? And I think that remained the case leading up to July 11th and certainly after. Um, but who's driving uh, recent changes in U.S.-Cuba policy? I think it's Cuban migrants. Uh, right. Oh, the fact true. that we have had 140,000 yeah. Cubans that have come to the country since October, a historic uh, exodus, really, that changed the calculus. And the Biden administration decided that they needed to do something to try to alleviate some of the economic pressure. I, I'm not convinced that it's going to work, but uh, that yeah. that's really driving uh, recent decisions. Yeah, I'm sure you are right. And we're glad that you brought that up. We're going to try to get to it. But you got there. So thanks very much, Michael Bustamante, for being with us. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back. To rewatch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, go right there, scan this QR code with your phone, and it takes you right to this This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. Thank you for being here with us this hour. And remember, we are online at local10.com 24-7.